everyone. Uh, welcome to an evening with Matt Failer. Woohoo! <laughs> Uh, my name is Brittany Schock. I'm the audience engagement editor here at Richland Source, uh, which if you didn't know, you're at Richland Source right now, so welcome. Uh, we are here at IdeaWorks, um, which is in downtown Mansfield, Ohio. We are the home base uh, for our offices at the Source. Uh, thank you all for being here. You guys look great. I'm glad to see how packed it is in here. Uh, clearly, a lot of you got hooked on Carl's coverage of Matt and the Iditarod, so we're thrilled to have you here. Um, you guys are part of a first because this is the first time that we've ever had an event sell out at Richland Source. <laughs> Not only that, but you sold this out in less than 10 hours, which is just unheard of. So we're so thrilled to have you here. Thank you all for your support. Um, and as you know, uh, you know, we're proud to announce that your support of this event also ended up raising $1,000 for the Richland County Humane Society. So give yourselves a hand. Some of you might have seen Nala, the uh, official mascot for the Humane Society on your way in here. So she's very grateful and she's up for adoption if you didn't know. Um, while we're talking about animals and fundraisers, um, I also wanna mention that the volunteers at the Richland County Dog Shelter have launched a fundraiser to replace several rundown kennels there. I believe Carl also wrote a story about that. Oh, that story was by Katie. So as you can tell, we care a lot about uh, animals and dogs around here. So um, as of this morning, that fundraiser is about $4,000 short of its $15,000 goal. So if you are so inclined, uh, please visit their GoFundMe page or contact the Richland County Dog Shelter on Home Road. Um, also, you likely noticed a paper on your chairs featuring Summit, who is our official, unofficial chief, chief morale officer uh, here at Richland Source and a member of the Humane Society class of 2021. Um, he can be found rummaging through the trash cans in this office uh, every once in a while. But Summit would like all of you to consider becoming Source members. A lot of you sitting in these chairs tonight are already Source members, so we want to say thank you to all of you for that. One of the perks of being a Source member was that you got early access to these sold out seats. So as you can tell, that was a nice perk because they sold out very, very quickly. So it was nice to have preferred access. Um, being a Source member really helps us do all of this cool stuff like having Matt here and doing this cool journalism. And it will help us do more in the future. So if you are so inclined, if you're not a member, uh, feel free to scan the QR code on the sheet um, or talk to Leah, who I think is still around here. Oh, she checked you in at the front desk. So, um, and you can become part of, oh, Carl, Summit's Richland Source sled dog team. <laughs> That's not the last bad joke you're going to hear. <laughs> also, um, if you become a member today, you will be entered into a drawing for a $25 gift card to Relax It's Just Coffee. So a little incentive for tonight. So without further ado, uh, we're going to get started on what we think is going to be a great next 90 minutes or so. Uh, behind me are our main characters for this evening. Uh, we have... Uh, Richland Source City Editor Carl Hunnell, who, as you know, <laughs> really um, immersed himself in, uh, you know, the Iditarod coverage for, uh, you know, the time being, uh, being up at 5 a.m. every morning, and it was a labor of love. And then, of course, the main character of the evening is 13-time Iditarod racer Matthew Failer. Take it away, Carl. Okay, thank you very much, Brittany. Uh, if you didn't know, Matt is the sled dog racer. If I was a sled dog racer, they don't have enough dogs. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get that out of the way. So thank you very much, Brittany. And allow me to again say welcome to all of you. Uh, had no idea uh, what we were gonna do with this tonight and was, it sold out so fast, I felt bad for Hayden because he made this wonderful promotional video to get people to buy tickets but it sold out before we had a chance to actually use it. 
So I put it on Facebook anyway because I felt bad for the boy. I wanted to get it out there. <laughs> um, we have a great night planned. I caution you in advance. I'm a writer, not a public speaker, and I'm also technologically, technologically challenged. So we're going to try to do some videos and things, but bear with me if I hit the wrong buttons and the wrong video or picture comes up. So I am thrilled and proud to be here with Matt, a member of the St. Peter's High School class of 2000. And one of the truly, you got, well, a lot of you folks already know him. Yeah. But if you, I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> but if you've not met Matt, uh, I've been doing this a long time. Truly one of the nicest guys you'll ever want to meet. So please welcome Matt again. Thank you. I did have a good time doing the daily kind of Matt Failer updates during the race. Wasn't exactly sure how to do it. I told my boss, I think I could do something about this every day. And he goes, great, how? And that's when I found Iditarod.com Insider. How many of you subscribe to that during the race? What a great website. Please don't tell them I use so much of their stuff. They might want to <laughs> yell at me about that. But, you know, getting up every day at 5 a.m. trying to figure out where Matt was. Uh, wishing they would inter interview him more in Dallas, CV less. But that's a, that's a whole other story. Um, when he finished the race in Nome, about 1,000 miles after it started, we talked on the phone for a final interview. And I said, hey, when you come back home, we'd love to do an event and, and have you there. He goes, yeah, about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I said, OK, uh, that'll be good. But that means this event had to come together faster than a sled dog team led by Sonic Boom and Maserati. <laughs> That's the second bad joke of the evening. So, <laughs> so this is our plan for the evening. Matt and I are going to talk for 30 or 40 minutes or less. Uh, we're gonna look, Matt's going to show us some videos, or I'm going to click them, and he's going to explain what they are, as well as some pictures that are going to let you, if you haven't seen them before, you get to see a side of his world in Alaska that you haven't seen before. And then it's going to be your turn. We've got a microphone set up. Uh, when we get to that point, anybody with a question can step up and ask it, and Matt has said he will answer every single question asked honestly and completely, uh, unless it's about Dallas CV, and then I'll answer it for him because he might not answer it honestly and completely. We're going to finish up around 8.30, but Matt has said he's willing to extend for a few minutes if we have a few questions that people still want to ask. So let's get started at the beginning. I've got to assume, just as a journalist, I have to assume there might be one or two people in the room who don't know the Matt Failer backstory. So we're going to start there. I know you were an outdoorsy kid growing up in the Failer clan. I think you had to be, right, Tim? You had to be. A Eagle Scout Award. But tell me, how did a St. Peter's graduate who goes to The Ohio State University, I went to the other one down in Athens, The Ohio University, but I wore the shirt for Matt. How did a fine arts photography student end up in Alaska? The, the, the dad joke is by airplane. <laughs> That's the third bad joke of the night, and I didn't tell that one. Um, and to preface, I'm, I'm not a public speaker. I just scoop dog poop for a living. Um, but uh, um, honestly, one of my good friends uh, that grew up in the neighborhood, his name's uh, Peter North, um, and Peter took a job in um, Alaska working in the summer and actually with sled dogs in the same company that I worked for and, and he came back he went to um, Miami in Ohio here and uh, we hung out one weekend he said I had the best summer job ever I got to work with sled dogs in Alaska and and he knew that I love dogs and the outdoors because of our, our upbringing and so he encouraged me to apply and I got a job as a dog handler which would be like an entry-level position uh, back in 2006. Is that right, Mom? 2006? Yeah. <laughs> I'll constantly refer to my wife, Liz, and my mom to make sure I don't mess any of this up. <laughs> well, talk about what you were doing up there as an intern, as, as a dog handler. What was that job? So the appeal was, um, it was like a camp where tourists would come off the cruise ships and um, they would get a sled dog tour. So they brought in mushers from Alaska and college students like myself who um, would kind of uh, harness the dogs, scoop up after them, and do a lot of the behind the scenes work. So they housed us. We, we slept in white walled tents on bunks in an old abandoned gold mine. And so we were set in this valley, beautiful mountains outside of Juneau. 
and, um, and they had a camp cook. So I didn't have rent and I didn't have to cook. And so it, that was a win for me as a college student. So I got to make money and save money at the same time. So you graduated from Ohio State. Uh, did you know even before you graduated, I'm going back to Alaska? Yes. Yes. So the first, the first uh, summer I took that job, a dog was born the day I got there. And I quickly asked the owner if I could adopt her. So she was born the day I moved there. And that dog's name is Fionn. Um, and uh, so I took her back home. And every summer I would go back to Alaska with the dog after, you know, the year of school. And so I did that a couple times and then graduated and then moved back up there full time. So after you graduate with a fine arts photography degree, and now you move back to Alaska, what did you do once you moved up there permanently? You're no longer an intern. No longer an intern. The guy that I w had been working for, the manager of that uh, tour camp, he was an Iditarod musher at the time, and a good friend of mine, his name's Matt Hayashida, and I got a, a year-round job kind of working with him at his home in the winter time. It was unpaid. I was more of like an intern there in the winter learning how to be a musher, and then the catch was I could go back to Juneau as a musher, and so kind of the next step up from handler. So I got a, a pay raise there. And I used Matt's dogs during the summer while he was managing. Uh, and then my dog, Fion, jumped into that clan. So I had one dog, and he had the other 30. <laughs> All right, since you didn't mention Alaska winter, uh, you brought some things with us, and I wanted oh, yeah. to take this time to have you explain what they are and give it a chance to pass them around so people can touch them and feel them and get an idea. So go ahead and take care of that part of it. Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, this is a seal skin and beaver hat that um, actually was awarded to us um, at the end of the Iditarod this year um, for the Herbie Nyuk Puck Award. For those of you that don't know, um, it's an award given to one of the mushers that best emulates Herbie's kind of spirit of the trail. And he's a uh, Inupiaq Eskimo musher above the Arctic Circle in a village called Shishmaref. And this was made by one of his family members. So a native woman stitched this up. And a seal skin hat is, is kind of like the Cadillac of hats. I mean, this is a pretty sweet hat. Um, and then these are beaver mitts that, that I'll use regularly. And if you'd like to you know, check them out, you can, you can feel them and look at them yeah. and put them on. Um, so just, well, you guys don't need to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pass them around this way. Matt yeah. did caution me that if you want to brush the beaver fur, Brush with the fur, not against it. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The seal uh, can just go down. That way, the, the hair doesn't get too brittle. <laughs> I guess. Um, All right. I can assure you that those look really cool up there. But if you walk around Mansfield wearing that, you might get looked at <laughs> kind of funny. <laughs> well, I would get up here for snow blowing, but I won't, haven't needed the last couple of years. Not going yeah. on. So. All right. So you settled down in Alaska. When did you get the notion of you know what I kind of I enjoy this sled dog stuff so much I'd like to do this myself and have my own team and my own stuff? Well, How'd so, you get started? Yeah, I guess early on when I was a, a college graduate, the first couple years out of college, I thought it would just be really a, a fantastic idea to try to adopt a few dogs and come back to Ohio and actually set up some kind of um, teaching program where I could go to schools and you know teach students about teamwork and use the dogs to kind of show them you know, what it's like with Alaska. And I didn't really have any inclination to stay in Alaska long term. And I didn't have any inclination to run the Iditarod because I knew how expensive of a sport it was. So I just figured I would work a few summers and winters and then move back. So what prompted you to actually, I mean, who, who was kind of your mentor? Who said, you know, Matt, if you want to do this, here's my best advice. I'm going to help you get started. Who kind of started you down that trail? So the manager that I was working for, Matt Hayashida, he he helped kind of push me in that direction a little bit more. Actually, it was during the, the housing market crashed in 07, 08, 09-ish in there. And um, I remember it vividly because I was still, I was back and forth living at home as a college student. And I was like, well, um, I got to, you know, try to find a long-term plan here. And Matt Hayashita said, you should just full plunge work for a, another musher. And his name was Martin Boozer. And he is a four-time Iditarod champion. And um, he had more things to offer. And so um, I called him. I cold called him. And uh, he said that he needed me yesterday when I talked to him. And so I said, I'll pack my car and start driving. And so I sat mom and dad down at the dinner table and 
packed my little Volkswagen Golf and drove to Alaska. I think I did it in like four days. And so um, I had two dogs at the time. And then a couple weeks later, Martin said, um, well, maybe we can get you in the Iditarod someday. While we were scooping poop, it was like 30 below zero outside. He said, maybe someday you could run this race. And that then made me start thinking long term about it. So what was, obviously, I don't think your first race was the Iditarod. It so, was not, no. So what was your first actual race? And how did you do? And what do you remember about that experience? So my first race was in 2010 or 11, 2010, I think. And um, it was 2011. It was the, the year of 2010, but then the calendar year turns over January. So it was the Cuscoquim 300. And um, as a rookie, I kind of got looked at um, a little funny because it's a, it's a premier race and it attracts most of the big names. And so as a, as a new recruit at Martin's, I didn't really understand what I was getting myself into. Um, and I remember it well because Martin had the A team and I had the B team. And so we have to fly all these dogs out to the remote village of um, Bethel. And um, my entire team were a bunch of females and a couple neutered males. And um, I had a bunch of dogs in the middle of their uh, heat cycle. So they were, <laughs> they were pretty rambunctious. And um, I'll never forget it because, so it's a, it's a really unique race. They start two teams at a time and all the villagers, all the native people come out and they line the chute and they're cheering you on. It starts at night. So it's dark out at, you know, six or seven o'clock at night and there's two dog teams and everyone's cheering you on. And they say three, two, one, go. And my entire team decided to ball up and <laughs> start dating each other, we should say. <laughs> And uh, as Didi Genro would say, she would say, oh, these dogs are dating each other. They're falling <laughs> in love. And so I had, I had one old dog named Man of War, and um, he was a neutered male. And, and uh, I just remember all these villagers looking at me like, you know, a Chichaco. A Chichaco is a, is a, a newbie in Alaska. So a Chichaco is like, um, if you're a sourdough, you've got the long beard. You've been there before. You, you, you're living. You know, you know what you're doing. And a Chichaco is a rookie. And so I'm sure they were calling me that. And um, I put Man of War in lead, and, and I asked him to string out the line, and um, he, he ran the whole race in lead. And we got Rookie of the Year in ninth, ninth place that year. But it was, it was a wild ride. Um, I got lost, and I tipped my sled over, and my snow hook, your snow hook set on the handlebar, and when I tipped over, they fell upright, and I sat on one. Oh. And, and the snow hook went right through my pants up against my thigh. And I looked down, and we're skidding across the ice, and um, it didn't cut me at all, but I, I've had this big hole in my pants. Um, but so, um, righted the sled. And then another funny story about that is I tried to change my runner plastic to get going at the last second, and I didn't, I just didn't know how to do it efficiently. Well, when I put the pin back in to hold the plastic on, I never closed it properly. And so one of those plastics slid off, and for 100 miles I ran without one set of plastic. And so when I got to the finish line, Martin, said congratulations, and then he just looked at the sled and he said, when did you try to change your runner plastic? And how did you know that? I never told you I did that. He said, because you're only running with half a set. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. So I'm, there was all kinds of stuff. I was going to ask you, what was Martin's impression of your finish, and you just told me that he... He was, yeah, yeah, no, he was, <laughs> he was real, he was real excited about it. All right, so you survived the Cusco. Mm -hmm. By the way, as a journalist who has to type letters, Alaskan town names baffle me. Okay? They're hard to pronounce. I, I, I don't worry about pronouncing them. I type them at 5 o'clock in the morning. I have no idea. I still, I still have nightmares about Una. Unilocally. Yeah, unilocally. You try to type that at 5 o'clock in the morning. It, it, I did a save git. I just hit control V control every, every time I needed to put it down. All right, so you made the big decision. You survived the Cusco. Your first I did a rod, 2012. Uh, as we talked about, it is the, the last great race. This is the big one, almost 1,000 miles. How did you prepare? I mean, how was it different? And what was that first year like that you actually did the Iditarod? Um, I mean, it was, honestly, I don't, I don't want to downplay it because it is a huge test, but I, I really did just buy into Martin, Martin's philosophy. And, and he's a great mentor. I mean, I believed in his system. And every day, I would kind of pick his brain and ask him questions. And so I felt very prepared. 
I, I felt super confident in the team. Um, and I ran, so he, again, he had the A team, and I had, I didn't have a B team, I had a puppy team. And the puppies were one year old at the youngest and a year and a half at the oldest. Um, so there were 16 of them, and none of them had been on a race longer than 300 miles, and none of them had ever been on the Iditarod. And so my goal was to just show them the trail in a, in a really easy manner, and so they could graduate, so to speak, and go to Martin's team. And so I, I looked at it like a, just a big camping trip, and, um, you know, there was all kinds of things that, that happened, but ultimately you're just traveling down the trail with your buddies, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was good. It wasn't... Wasn't as, there, was, there wasn't as many storms that year. Um, there were beautiful northern lights. I mean, I had, I had my hands full, but it was overall a, a pretty good experience, and I wanted to do it again immediately. Now, I've told you this before, but I'm going to say it in front of a group of people. You have an innate ability to make all of this sound easy. <laughs> I mean, I've... I mean, I didn't know all the... Th I mean, like, calorie intake and how much sleep, and I was a wreck. The dogs were doing pretty good. <laughs> Um, I, I ate probably way too many Sour Patch Kids and way too many dried, dried mangoes, and, you know, I was falling asleep all the time, but I wasn't drinking enough water, so I think as I got better, I would manage my, my levels and, and, you know, learn. Now, speaking of dogs and taking care of them, you and I talked about this last year, and I, until I started following the, uh, the website this year, and I saw the interviews and saw the videos, I didn't realize, and I don't know if everybody does, so I'll ask the question. People don't realize that when you take a break, okay, you don't get the break that the dogs get. Talk about what you have to do when you come to a spot that you're going to rest the team. When do you get to rest, and what do you have to do before you get to that point? So I guess if you're looking at like a, you know, a competitive schedule, um, and it's changed ever since my first, I did a rod in 2012 to now. Um, Usually it's a, anywhere from four to six hours of a break, and that, that might also depend on your running schedule. But um, in a, in a four-hour break, the dogs obviously come first, so um, you're going to need to uh, prepare their food right away. And so if there's water available to you, um, like the, in some of the villages, they'll cut a hole in the ice in the river, and they'll pull water out and have it in a big 50-gallon a big drum. And so if they have water, that's great, because otherwise I'd need to start my cooker and get a fire going and melt snow. So that takes probably 15 minutes. So if you can cut out 15 minutes of your four-hour break, and that's, that's going to save you a lot of time, 15 minutes that I could be sleeping. Um, so you immediately set the front hook, take off their booties, and you get your cooker going if you don't have water. Um, and you'll want to feed them right away, um, get them to bed, fix any of your, any of your broken parts on your sled. Um, this year I had three bolts break on my sled and I found out I was supposed to leave like right at the four hour mark and I was changing my runner plastic and I looked down and these bolts just fell out of the sled. As you're going over a rough part of the trail, the sled flexes and these bolts then start to kind of like get loose and they shear right off, right? Well, I had three spare bolts of that size, so I used them right away in the first hundred miles. Um, thankfully, I didn't need any more, but... Um, you got to fix your sled, and long or short answer is in a four-hour break, you're probably going to get two hours of sleep if you're pretty quick and if you have water available. If you don't have water available, you'll probably get about an hour and a half. Um, so, so then it comes into about a six-hour run and a four-hour break. You have 10-hour increments. You get one hour of sleep or two hours of sleep every 10 hours. And so if you do not add sleep, you just start to make mistakes, you know. So you have to try to take care of yourself. And you're doing this in Alaska where it's at least, cold. I mean, it wasn't so bad this year, but temperatures could be yeah, anywhere from, in my 12 years, 13 years, 65 below zero and 40 above in the same race. Yeah. One day later, uh, so 65 below on our way to Huslia one year, and then the next day it was like 40 and sunny yeah. with no wind. I think it was kind of warm or warmer than the dogs liked at the beginning of this year's race. I didn't realize that. But then when I saw the first team stopping, the first thing these dogs do is dive into the snow. They love to roll in the snow. Yeah, a lot of our guests that come take our tour, they'll comment on that. The dogs, immediately when you stop, they bury their face in the snow and they roll around. and They're either cooling off or putting their scent down. 
Um, and yeah, it's, they can eat the snow while they run to kind of cool their intake or get, you know, hydration. Um, because remember, they, uh, they have a hard time getting rid of body heat. So unlike human beings that sweat and, you know, perspire, dogs don't do that. So every year I, I make, I tease my mom a little bit. Every year someone says, oh, you know, what, how do the dogs stay warm? I say, oh, my mom asks me this. She goes, you, those poor dogs, they're going to be cold out there. And I say, mom, damn it, I'm the one that's cold. <laughs> the dogs are the ones that are, they're just fine, you know. And she goes, oh, I'm worried about those dogs out there. It's your son that you're worried about. <laughs> It's really not like that. I just tease her a little bit. <laughs> At the risk of a journalist doing math. Now, since you started racing the Iditarod, and I did some math today, I counted you've spent about 130 days total on the Iditarod Trail. And I added up the hours. That's like more than 2,600 hours mushing just in the Iditarod. So you first one in 2012, you did some more. 2018 was different. You finished 13th, which was your best finish to date at that point, but you also met a TV reporter with the CBS News affiliate in Anchorage named Liz Rain. And I wanted to show the first video of the day, and I want you to explain what in the world is going on. You want me before the video or after? Oh, no, we're going to see the video, and then, okay. we're gonna, <laughs> then, then you can talk about it. Kaiser was not the only one sitting in the winner's circle uh, oh, yesterday. Oh, it, yeah, this is pretty great. It was also a big day for Matthew Failer, who had a very important question to ask at the end of his race. Photojournalist John Thane has that story, an all-important answer. Last year, Cusco 300 champion. It's been a 300-mile adventure for Matt Failer. Take home second place here in 2020. It's a great finish for Failer his seven dogs, and most of all, Good job. his girlfriend, Liz Raines, who's been by his side for almost two years. Nobody else, Liz is the one, yeah. And uh, hopefully I'm the one for her. <laughs> now it looks like Matt and Liz are teammates for life. I love you too, I love you so much. Along with plenty of furry friends. <laughs> Dog mushing is full of surprises. I didn't know this was coming. I didn't know when it was coming. As more adventures come, they'll do them together. John Thane, KTVA 11 News. All right, so I read the story that was in the New York Times. I'd be the first couple I've met whose wedding was detailed in the New York Times. So I read that uh, again today. But it, before we get any further, I need Liz and Theo to stand up. If you haven't met them yet, this is Liz and Theo. <laughs> I need you to explain, and then we'll allow Liz time to re for rebuttal if she disagrees. <laughs> but explain how you guys met and how we ended up at that moment in the Cusco 300. Oh, my. All right. The hard-hitting questions. Um, so Liz, as you guys know, uh, was a news reporter and for Channel 11, and um, she was covered uh, the assignment of uh, the Iditarod, working the Iditarod. And um, at the beginning of the race in one of the big, um, you know, big, uh, what would you call that? Like the Denina Center, Convention Center, um, there's a banquet and all the mushers go and they draw their starting bib number and family and sponsors and the news team is there. Well, she didn't need to be there that night. Um, she's always been an overachiever. And so she said that she'd like to go down and just work extra and kind of cover the mushers and learn about the race before she went out on the trail. So she didn't need to be there and got clearance from her boss to go or whatever. And um, she was working, working the front as the mushers go up on stage and uh, yeah, I walked right up to her and just basically um, asked her uh, who, who she was and what her name was. And um, her senior worker basically told her that I was a huge flirt and that it wasn't a big deal. <laughs> and to which I told her that I was just, I was just being a gentleman. I, you know, <laughs> um, chivalry was not dead. And I just decided to, you know, talk to her. Anyways, I went back to the table, and um, I told mom and dad that I met, met the prettiest lady in the room. And um, 
that, that's, that's just basically history now. Um, so we started dating right after that. But I was still going down to Juno. So this whole time from the beginning, I was taking my dogs down to Juno. I did that for like 13 summers. And then I'd race, I did ride in the winter. And um, so we had a long distance relationship for a few years. And um, yeah. One of the things I enjoyed when I read this story is, while well, you were certainly impressed when you met Liz, when I read the story, uh, her initial impression of dog mushers wasn't all that positive. Mm. I think the quote was, they were kind of full of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so somehow you, you, you managed to swing that. I think you also impressed her, uh, you were working in a place where you didn't have great cell phone reception. Correct, And yep. you had to go stand in a particular, <laughs> you had to, because you, you called her every night. Yep, that's right. And you'd go stand and find the one spot where you could get one bar. Yep. And every night, and yeah. then one, I, I think she told the reporter from the New York Times she knew how committed you were when a call dropped one night, and then you immediately called her back and said, sorry, I had to change feet. Yes, that's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that camp I was working for, was it's on the Mendenhall Glacier, so it's like 12 miles up a glacier in the middle of nowhere, and you have to angle this cell phone booster, start the generator, <laughs> And if it's windy, you get a signal. And if the generator dies and you don't have any gasoline to start the generator, then you get on the snow machine and you drive three miles up to the top of the mountain and you can get one bar. <laughs> and so I was doing that a lot. Yeah. So every night I would call. Well, you proved yourself and yep. here you are. All right. So <laughs> you get married. You look at the picture here. This was in, like, what, June of 2020? Yep. yep June of 2020. July. July. Okay. Thank sorry. You. Sorry. Whoa. I got married in June. I'm not trying to get you in at, trouble. At home, we have it tattooed above the house, so mm -hmm. we're not at home right now. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So right uh, about the same time, you know, you guys get married in July. Thank you, Liz, of, of, of 2020. Uh, all of a sudden, here comes COVID, and things change. Yeah. I think within two weeks of you guys getting married, the TV station where Liz was working <laughs> shuts down. Yeah. Uh, you had some decisions to make. Do you stay in Alaska? Do you go someplace else? Liz is a trained journalist, could work anywhere. Um, yeah. So talk about how you made those decisions and how you chose to stay in Alaska and turn it into kind of in the family business. Yeah, so we, we did have some serious questions facing us. And um, so let's see here. Um, we had just... How did that work? So I proposed, and in between that, like, sh we were planning the wedding, and she got an email saying that her news station was going to close, and that was two weeks after we had just gotten married, right? That's the timeline. I always mix it up here. Because it was a lot going on at that time. And um, we had an outdoor wedding, you know, um, and the honeymoon was quickly over, so to speak, because... I, at that time, I was still taking all of my dogs down to Juneau. Uh, well, we, we, we started doing a few tours at home, but she had a really nice job in Anchorage, albeit she had to drive. Um, but once she lost her job, we said, well, there's only one other news station in town, and they don't need any anchors. She was a news anchor. And um, so they offered her a different job that wasn't to her liking. And um, the other news station's in Fairbanks, and it's a smaller market, and we weren't going to move there. Um, so we looked at Denver. We looked at other cold climates that we could have sled dogs, and um, it was a real big, you know, letdown for us because she had put maybe five or six years in, and um, very good. She won in, um, multiple awards through her journalism career, and we kept kicking around the small idea of maybe starting our own tour business, um, and it was kind of like maybe we could make this work. We'll just turn some of the race sleds, we'll put, get rid of the bag, put a seat on it, you know, and the race dogs can start doing tours. And we already had trails, and we did have a view of Denali on the property. And so, um, yeah, we started looking at the website and asking friends to help us build a website. And um, Alaskan Husky Adventures was born kind of out of necessity. So it was a COVID, a COVID pandemic job that was born out of necessity. Um, and so the first year we had to send our guides home. Um, we didn't, didn't have anything going on. And then the next year was still kind of COVID. We had in-state travel. A few people came. And then these last two years, we've been finally picking things up. And so we're doing a lot better now. So it's, it's turned into a, a fun job. 
For those who aren't familiar with Alaskan Husky Adventures. Welcome to Willow. Just a short drive from Anchorage, it's the mushing capital of the world and the home of our champion Huskies. Learn what it takes to train a competitive Iditarod dog team. Drive your own sled or ride with an experienced guide. Catch Denali views from our private trails. Play with puppies. And make lifelong memories. Are you ready for an adventure? Book yours today. Alaskan Husky Adventures, aka husky.dog. See what happens when you match a, somebody that knows about art and somebody that knows about video. Things, things work out very well. But then there's also, just in case people think it's only a wintertime business. Oh, that's the wrong one. Did I get the summer one? I think I did. No, I think I got the picture. Yeah, the dogs yeah. do. They, they run in the summertime. We imported these really cool carts uh, from overseas, and we could put just two people in them, and the guide on the back, and the tourists or you know locals can sit down and ask the experienced guide or myself or Liz, and we're mushing along on our trails. And so they get a really, just a good, intimate, like, in-depth tour. Um, you know which one it is. Um, and uh, it's, we, it's an authentic experience. So Thank you. both of our guides, uh, Casey Murringer, who a lot of you know, um, she ran the I Did Rod in 2020, and then Dane Baker is just qualified uh, for the I Did Rod. He'll be running next year. So our, our guides and myself, we, we feel like we give a really nice tour from the I Did Rod perspective. Remember I told you about technology challenges. Well, this is what it kind of looks like in the summer. I think that it's important to show people our lifestyle. This is what we do day in and day out. Every single day we try to put the dogs in a position to succeed. Our dogs love what they do. By allowing a sled dog to be a sled dog, we're creating a healthy environment. It's playing with them, it's socializing, it's letting the dogs run free as a pack. It's fun. Willow, Alaska is considered to be the capital for dog mushing. This is my home. It takes about an hour and a half drive to get to our facility from Anchorage. We have specially designed carts. Just two people per guide. Eight dogs are gonna pull you around our private trails where we actually train on for the I Did Rod. It is a contagious, energetic environment. Our guests would leave here and they're gonna feel part of our team. My, the, my, my mentor, Martin Boozer, taught us how to free run, and so we would turn them loose, and uh, like 40 dogs, and we would go hiking with a whole pack of dogs, and I always thought it was the coolest thing to not have them on leashes, because the property just butts up to like swamp and state land, and so Martin would regularly turn, yeah, 40 dogs loose and just go on a hike, and they're all just getting along, you know, so because many, he's raised them from, we, we raise our own from, you know, puppies. How many dogs do you have now? I have a kennel of 50. One of the things I noticed and I found, found interesting is when you have a set of puppies, you tend to give them some name that's familiar or as a group, like mm -hmm. a heavy metal group. Mm -hmm. And tell the folks about the, uh, the litter you just had this year and how, how their names came to be. Yeah, so that's right. We do, we kind of follow the theme personnel or theme idea. Some other mushers might just choose, if it's their first litter ever, they'll start with the letter A, you know, and they'll go through the whole alphabet if they are in the sport for a long time. And as, as the dogs grow up, it's really easy to remember who's related. So this last litter, we have the, the, um, the country legends. So there's Dolly, and we have Reba, and um, Merle, Willie, and Waylon. 
and uh, Loretta and Emmy Lou. And so they're the country legends, and um, we chose to uh, go with that name um, in part because some of our Dane really loves country music, and so do I. And they're just strong, awesome names that seem to fit their personalities. All right, so fast forward three years from 2020, uh, the race in 2023, your best finish in terms of the Iditarod, finished eighth place, uh, first time you finished in the top 10. How did everything kind of come together last year to kind of give you that really good finish and that good moment? Yeah, well, I should point out too, there's several people in the room that have adopted dogs from us over the years. So there's, uh, there's several supporters here that actually have some of our sled dogs. Um, and um, so uh, for most of you, you might already know this, but um, you have 16 dogs. And if you're lucky enough, if you have a, a great enough team, maybe all 16 of them can do the task the same rate, the same speed and sleep the same amount of time. Um, but if you have a bunch of freshmen and a bunch of seniors, you have to tailor your, your traveling schedule to the weakest common denominator. And so that might be the slowest member. Um, and so you've, over the years, instead of removing the dog, we call it dropping the dog. Um, now they call it returning. But instead of removing the dog and sending the dog home and maybe going faster, I, I've been, I'd give extra rest to, to allow the dog to stay in the team. And um, if you give them too much rest, a lot of teams will pass you. Um, so that, that's usually been my, you know, my MO over the, my early part of my career. But two years ago, instead of giving that additional rest for the one dog, I chose to just send them home. And because of that, we got down to only six dogs, but we finished in eighth place. And so on the surface, what that means is that six of the dogs out of my kennel could do a top 10 uh, pace. And the other 10 couldn't do a top 10 pace. They needed more rest, and we probably would have finished 15th or 20th, but I would have finished with 10 or 15 or whatever. Um, so. You know, when you get into maybe some of the bigger kennels like Dallas or some of the other mushers who maybe have 60 dogs, or maybe they have a better breeding program, they might have eight or 10 that can do a top 10 pace. So that particular, that particular year, if, if they needed five hours of rest, I wasn't gonna give it to them. I really, I thought it was my last Iditarod, so I wanted to make the top 10, and only six uh, made it to the finish line, and that's Mach 10, McLaren, Cadillac, Zeppelin, and then uh, mm -hmm. Ballad and Saga. And Ballad and Saga finished this year, Cadillac finished this year, and Mach 10 finished this year. Um, and, you know, the dogs, they can sustain injuries, but a lot of the time it's because they're, they need more rest. You know, they, they just need more time. Um, and, yeah, it's, they're, they're amazing dogs, but when you're trying to win this race, they, they need to be in elite shape and perfect health. And if one of them, like, um, McLaren on the front right, my, my front left, um, when you're looking at him from the mush point of view, she stepped in a moose hole and I saw it happen. She's running, running along and she put her paw right into a hole and she came up with a sore tricep. And I could tell, you know, because now she's running with a little bit of a gimp and so she got dropped at the next checkpoint. Just like that. And they take two million steps from Anchorage to Nome and you gotta hope those two million steps, they don't step on a rock, they don't step in a hole, they don't slip on the ice and so, it's sometimes it's just a gamble, you know, mm -hmm. and she's totally fine now, but at the time, you know, she had a sore tricep, so she couldn't continue. My favorite story, in, in addition to finishing eighth last year, is when we talked about Led Zeppelin and his performance, I think it was going up a mountain or a big hill. Talk about kind of Led Zeppelin's big claim to fame last year. He's been the unsung, unsung hero. He's kind of a, um, a dog that doesn't really find himself in lead ever, and he's not really in the back. He's kind of in the middle. Um, he's now almost nine years old. He'll be nine years old this, uh, this summer. And I'd never run him in lead, but leaving one of the checkpoints a couple years ago, um, I'm just moving dogs around to try to figure out the, the best efficient way to go down the trail. And um, it just looked like it was his turn, you know, based on his body language. and. Um, I put him in lead and we ran out of the checkpoint like, like he'd been a lead dog his whole life, um, even though he wasn't. And then we get to this mountain, it's on um, the Bering Sea, leaving Elam. So we're like eight, eight or 900 miles into the race and we go up this mountain they call Little McKinley. And of course, so it's like a gigantic mountain. Uh, and he pulls up 
the mountain in lead. Yep, so it's on the far left side, uh, three to the right from Nome there, Elam. You get down onto the sea ice and then you climb this big mountain. And at the top of the mountain, it was blowing like 60 miles an hour. And he did great <laughs> until he got to the top. And then he wanted to go right back into the middle of the team. <laughs> and then I moved McLaren and Mach 10 back up there. So you, sometimes you have to move them around to give them a break, you know. Not everybody wants to be a leader for 1,000 miles, so you kind of move them around. Um, well, so. One of the things I found interesting about that story was uh, when you first put him in the lead, uh, you said, he, I think his first 30 minutes he was busy flirting. Yeah, he did a little bit of with, that. With, with the dog next to him, but once, that, yeah. once he got that out of his system, he kind of... Yep, he was kissing her face and you know, <laughs> yeah, kind of licking her mouth. And <laughs> I'm like, hey, man, come on, we're on a race here, you know. <laughs> All right, so that brings us to this year's race. And let me get this year's map up. I don't know, explain to folks, there's two different trails. Yep, yep, so this is the southern route. Um, you can see at the very bottom of that, that U-shaped red line. Um, I did a rod, is in the bottom right-hand corner there. And um, the original route is started in 1973, and they went to the north, to the Yukon River. And a few years later, all the villagers in Shagluck, Anvik, Grayling, they said, hey, we would like to participate in this race too. And this is called the Iditarod Trail. So maybe we can get the race to go through the town of Iditarod. Um, so it gets kind of confusing. There's the National Historic Trail known as the Iditarod Trail, which starts in Seward, goes up through around Anchorage all the way to Nome. So there are 22 National Historic Trails in the United States. This is the only trail that commemorates dogs. So it's a pretty unique trail. And then the Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race. And then the Iditarod Place is actually like a place on the map. So three Iditarods. Nobody lives in Iditarod. It's an old gold mining town, one of the last gold, gold rushes in America. Um, and so, yeah, they decide to go through the town of Iditarod. There's still, like, the bank is dilapidated, and there's an old brothel, and there's just shacks that are kind of falling over. Nobody lives out there anymore. Well, I thought I had saved the northern map, because you were on the northern map this year. But apparently, I, oh, here it is. Again, technology challenged. Yep, this so then the, the northern route. This make was the, the race split. that you ran this year. Yep, you make the split at Ofer. And Ofer is uh, actually, Ofer is a privately owned um, like place where it's kind of like deer camp. Um, a family owns it, they built the building, and they go out there and hunt and fish and do whatever it is they do. And they, they allow the Iditarod mushers to utilize their cabin. It's probably like a 10 by 12 cabin, and they cook for us, and, and they made the best drippy egg sandwich I had in my life out there. Um, and I stayed my 24 in Ofer. And then you'll go north to Cripple, nobody lives in Cripple, and then Ruby. So those are the most remote sections of the trail. Uh, Ruby all the way to Nome, that's all native, native villages. And then uh, Takatna, McGrath, and Nikolai are native communities. And Roan is a Bureau of Land Management public use cabin that anybody can rent and go out there. And Rainy Pass is a lodge, and Finger Lake is a lodge. People, people uh, buy a plane ticket to go fly out there and like spend the night. Um, okay, so th this year's race follows this trail. Now you would finish second this year again in the Cusco. Uh, I think you acquired six dogs from Richie Deal's team when he mm -hmm. decided to at least momentarily retire. You had a lot of mom a lot of momentum going into the start. Uh, I guess the official start is down here in Anchorage, but then the Next day, you actually start in Willow, yep. where, where you live. Um, talk about this race. I know uh, it was kind of a slower start than maybe you had anticipated, uh, maybe extra rest for your team along the way. What, kind, what did you run into there at the start that maybe made you think we need to just back off a little bit? Well, so getting back to the whole chemistry of the team, the makeup of our team this year, composed of a lot of talent. Um, but again, it's 16 dogs that um, like 14 of them want to run about 10 miles an hour. And then there are two of them that if you do 10 miles an hour with them, they like to do that, but they'll eventually wear down and they can't, they can't maintain that. So I, I tried really hard to stay at about nine miles an hour. And there are a few moments where I could feel or check my GPS that we were creeping in the 10 mile an hour range. Um, so Sonic Boom and Maserati, um, who are well known around here, um, 
Maserati, she, if she lopes too much, she gets tight triceps. So I actually massaged her every stop. There's Sonic. Um, and because of that, and because we went a little slower, both of those dogs finished. And I'm not throwing them under the bus, but it's just the way it is. They, they're just a little bit, a half a step slower. And I could have dropped them and continued on, but I just felt that I was going to need them. And Sonic led a lot. And so he is a big part, and Maserati did too. They're a big part of why we finished where we did. So if you start to, if you run, sh it's like the tortoise and the hare debate. If you, if you run slow, you spend less energy so the dogs don't need as much rest. And if you run fast, you spend more energy. The dogs need more sleep to build the energy to keep going. And so I had a, like a blended team. And um, yeah, I probably was giving a little bit more rest. But again, I was just playing it conservative, you know. Right. Well, one of the things I noticed, and again, just reminded me of what a nice guy you are, and Liz might disagree with this, but one of the early stops, uh, I did a raw.com insider, film crew, reporter, asking you questions, and she's doing the interview while you're literally trying to take your dog's boots off and get them settled, and you're such a nice guy, you patiently answer every question while you're in the process of doing this. Yeah, I, I guess it's just, I mean... I figured I wasn't trying to be rude. I figured that I could do it at the same time to be efficient, you know, because I didn't want to, like, it's hard to come out of race pace, especially when you want to do well and you want to finish, so, you know, in the top 10. So as soon as, it's hard to slow your mind down because you're like, I got to do this, I got to get it done, I have to be efficient, and then I got to go to sleep. And you know you want to say hi to some of the villagers and answer some questions from reporters. So I figured we could do it at the same time. And... Um, yeah, so I had my head down the whole time, unbooting the dogs while I was interviewing her. Well, I appreciated you doing the interview because I put my phone down beside it and recorded the interview so I could then get quotes that I could actually use in the story. And I figured you actually did it because Liz has told you, never turn down the interview. Yep, it's part of my, it's, it's, it's written in the bylaws of the marriage. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, so you're hanging around the top ten. I know there's a lot of, like, you know, You'd pass some people, and then you'd stop, and they'd pass you. But you're right in there, 8 to 12 range somewhere. And if folks can see the, the mousing, we're talking about a spot between Caltag. Caltag, yep. And this town I can't pronounce yep. it. Una Laclete. Yeah, Una, Una Laclete. Um, you're in good position. The dog, you, you've rested the dogs. Things are looking good. Probably looking at another top 10 finish. Talk about what happened along the trail between Caltag and Unicolite. Unicolite. Yep, Unicolite. Um, yeah, we were sitting pretty good. I mean, I had, I think, maybe 10 or 11 dogs, and um, maybe more, maybe 12 at that time. And there is, that's a long section between Caltag and Unicolite. I think it's 85 miles. And so there's two cabins. There's two public use shelter cabins that you can use. One is about uh, 30 miles from Caltag. So you'll, you'll see mushers start in New, New Lotto and they'll skip Caltag and they'll go to the other cabin and, um, and make that their little, you know, rest checkpoint. But they need to grab their straw and all their dog food from Unilaclete and carry on. Um, or you can stop in Caltag and move to Old Woman Cabin, which is about halfway. And that's a pretty safe play. Or you can go past Old Woman and stop between Old Woman and Unilaclete and then maybe skip Unilaclete. And um, the mushers that end up making a push late in the race usually skip Unilaclete because it turns, you know, four runs into three and three stops into two stops. And so now all of a sudden you're three or four hours ahead of your competitors because you extended the run by five or ten miles and you cut a rest if your dogs can do that. So you just kind of start looking at it. And my, my, a, my a plan was to skip Old Woman and go past and camp and then skip Unilaclete. Um, and, but I was going back and forth trying to figure out which one I was going to do. And then I came upon Hunter. Um, and so for those of you that don't know, it was probably the worst day of his life. In fact, I know it was because he told me Hunter Keefe had a dog pass away, um, on that run and the dog fell over in harness while running. And, um, it's the worst thing anybody can imagine. And it can happen to anybody at any time. It could happen to you walking your dog, um, and so, unfortunately, um, it happened to him. And, uh, yeah, I, I came upon him, and um, he turned around. And I had 
I, had, I didn't know what was going on because I, I could see that I was coming up on a team and I was just going to say, hey, I'll pass you on the left. And as soon as he turned around, I could see he was in tears and um, pretty emotional. And so I just set my hook. He told me what had happened. And so I gave him a big hug. And, you know, plans changed. And so um, we were five miles from Old Woman and um, just decided to help him out. You know, we went to Old Woman um, and... Ryan Reddington was there, Pete Kaiser was there, um, and so, yeah, we had to immediately get a hold of race marshals, and you have to, you know, get a hold of them, because there's going to be a necropsy, and no dog dies in vain, you have to do a study to try to, you know, have less of them, so it's been five years since I did run had a dog die, so it was a huge deal, so. So you stopped, you, I think you spent six hours? Yeah, I spent no six way. hours there. We, we, he was resting about six, and I was doing four, and I knew his schedule, so I just said, hey, let's just, you want to just stay six? And so that's a pretty lonely spot. I've never had a dog pass away in my own team, but I've seen it before. Um, and again, it's something that he could not have prevented. Um, the necropsy hasn't come back yet, but I saw the team move out of the checkpoint, and um, they were happy as can be. And, you know, it might have been just a heart attack. It could have been... And who knows what, I'm not sure, but the gross necropsy is still, still in the works. And they're doing tissue samples. It could take months. Um, so, so we just stayed together. And at that point, it doesn't really even matter. Um, the, the race was stretching out. I knew I wasn't going to catch the leaders. I didn't need to skip old woman. You know, so he just needed somebody. And I know when you and I talked about this the first time, I said, well, I think you're, you're, you're being a little modest because you said you did what anybody would have done. I don't know that I necessarily agree that everybody would have done what you did. Well, maybe, maybe not, but, you know, I mean, yeah, to, to me at, the, at that point it just didn't really matter. And obviously it made a big impact on him. You get to the finish line uh, at the awards banquet. Uh, he nominates you for sportsman. Yep. Which isn't the first time that you've gotten kind of a major award, so... Talk a little bit, and I know you get fairly emotional. I did watch the video, and we're able to share that on, on the source website. But talk about the honor, yeah. what he said, how that evening felt for you. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, for those of you that don't know, uh, those guys, and there were three uh, this year that passed away, and all three of those guys are receiving death threats and hate emails from, you know, certain small groups. And so it's just not fair. Um, but, yeah, he nominated me for Sportsmanship Award, so it's just a nice gesture. Yeah. Well, it was, it, that looks like a very fun banquet. I, I love the music of the three-man band that was playing there. And oh, yeah. What was on the menu that night? Um, I don't even remember. It was pretty good, though. They had uh, chocolate strawberries and, um, yeah. Um, now, obviously, it's an emotional experience, but it just... You know, they love their dogs, and they were doing right by their dogs, and it's just an unfortunate deal all the way around. But, um, yeah, when you get to the finish line, there's a finisher's banquet and, or a finisher's meeting, and all the mushers, anybody that's ever finished the race can be there, and, and all the mushers get together. It's a closed-door meeting, and we talk about how we can make the race better and, and rule changes and everything, and then you can vote on these, on sportsmanship uh, and um, some of the other awards that are voted on by uh, by the mushers. And so I knew I was nominated, but then there were three other mushers that were nominated too. And so I didn't know who won until that night. All right, let's find the video that shows the finish this year. If I go, oh, go back to this one real quick. This is, I believe, the show It Takes a Village. This is there the whole go. team. Uh, yeah. At the starting line there in down with this Anchorage or, or Willow. This is Anchorage, yep, at the, at the ceremonial start. The two kneeling down on the bottom right with the red beard, that's Dane Baker, and then Casey on, on our left, Casey Murringer. So she's been with us for six years, and um, they're at home right now uh, running the dogs, keeping them happy, and doing tours. And when we get back from vacation, then they get to leave for the whole month of May, so they'll be on their vacation. And gosh, both of them are from Michigan. Um, <laughs> the one... And, and you're going to let him <laughs> run your dogs next year? Yeah, I don't know what happened. I've been... 
I've been kicked in the head too many times. Um, the one is a troll and the other is a youper, if you get those. So the one is a, is a lower peninsula and the other one's a youper. Um, they're the greatest people. They're really nice. They love their dogs. They, they're amazing with them. And they're just people that we want to surround ourselves with. They're, they're honest, hardworking, and they love dogs. And, and yeah, so the red, the red beard guy, Dane Baker, he'll be racing. I did a rod with the Country Legends litter next year and a bunch of the older dogs to kind of make for a, you know, uh, yeah, a JV team, I guess. Yeah. So when are you going to make up your mind about next year's race, or have you already? Um, well, I guess we're, we're pretty sure that I'm probably going to sit it out, but it, it's not set in stone yet. Um, uh, now that we have our son Theo, and, um, you know, it's just, I've done 13 now, and so I think I'll be sitting out next year, unless something happens, unless Oprah or Nike or anyone <laughs> else is watching. You know, if they want to sponsor the team, we can get another one in. Um, yeah, so probably just Dane. I'm going to do the Cusco and the Kinnick, though. That's still in the works. And then once th those races are over, we can have Dane take the team. All right, well, let's look at a couple of other videos here. This one I felt, thought was really good. And I'll, like, I'll let it come up, and you explain it before we show it. Yeah, so this is, um, this is on the Iditarod this year. And um, this is on the Farewell Lakes in the Alaskan Mountain Range. Alaska Mountain Range, and that's after Rhone to Nikolai. And these lakes are usually polished glare like that. That's very common. It's very windy. There was a, a forest fire that went through there, a natural fire that burned down all the trees, and it's so windy that all the snow just gets blown away. And so the scratch marks are from snow machines that put in the trail, and then they have to take a, a chainsaw or a drill to put the the trail marker in the ice. They can't set it, so they have to cut in the ice and put the trail marker. And sometimes it's very windy, and if it's really windy, you need to take the booties off the dogs so they can grab the ice. And some years, you can look down and actually see the bottom of the water and, um, and the frozen like seaweed under there, and um, you'll feel the little stress, stress fractures, and the dogs will feel this like pop and then they'll pick up the speed because you feel the cracks and everything. And you have to train your leaders, you know, to follow those markers because if they're not used to the slippery ice, if the wind blows, they'll just kind of follow the, the wind over to the other side of the, the lake. I think this was a little closer to the end. Yep, so that is about 20 miles from the finish line. We go over that, that hump on the right. That's the last mountain you go up and over and Safety Roadhouse, which is a checkpoint, is two miles behind me. Who's your videographer? <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's Sonic Boom and Mach 10 in lead. Uh, Mach 10's personal supporters here in the room, they've been boosting Mach 10 for a long time now. So that is a long run. That's 77 miles from, that's longer from here to Columbus. So it's you know, 77 miles from White Mountain to, to the finish line. And it started at like 20 below zero. So the jackets are on the dogs. And then as the sun comes up, now it's like 30 degrees. They don't need jackets on. So you have to stop, take all the jackets off, give them a piece of fish, you know, let them roll around in the snow. Um, and you go through two blowholes, the windy sections through there. This is one of my favorite videos you sent me. Oh, yeah. So this is a mile from the finish line. It was a great time to finish. There's like 6 p.m., so everyone's out and walking around. And <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they're all out cheering and... Um, the dogs kind of got startled because when I waved the kids over, they all ran and the dogs were like, what? you know, a thousand miles you don't see kids running over and then at the last minute there's people everywhere. So there's a little bit of shock, you know, coming out of the woods and now there's like people everywhere. All right, one of the videos I took, this is me holding this in front of Iditarod.com and trying to shoot a video of their video. Yeah, this is a Shaq Tulik. Yeah, and this is the pizza delivery. Yep. Now this is a guy who... Literally, how far did you carry this pizza? Oh, like 50 miles. 50 miles, and I want you to... How 40 miles, yeah. That's Sonic there in the lead, right? Yep, and McLaren. Yep. 
This is a native community out on the Bering Sea called Shack Tulik, and this is, there's a, it's a spit of land, um, and the lagoon on one side and the Bering Sea on the other, and it's, I can't believe people live out there. It's in the middle of nowhere, and it's very windy. Uh, a very windy day to me would be like a normal day to them, you know, and um, they don't have a pizza joint there. So at the previous checkpoint in Unilaclete, they have a really nice pizza place, and some of our supporters buy pizza and have it sent to the checkpoint. And so it arrives, when I'm there, it arrives, and there's like, yes, exactly, yes. So Mrs. Riggleman and a bunch of the other ladies, they buy these pizzas, and now there's like 10 pizzas. I can't eat all of them, so I, I shove two or three in the sled and take them to the next village. And it's become a tradition. It's probably my favorite stop is Shack Tulik, and the little kids just go crazy because it's frozen delivered pizza. <laughs> And it was, it was interesting, when we recorded this, I wasn't even sure what it was until we looked at it again, and I said, well, that's, that's the pizza. He's handing it right there. Yeah, that's a Gary Bacolik. He's a native guy that grew up there. That's a sweet-looking dog team. <laughs> <laughs> There's, yep. And I think you headed off to take a to And then, a yep, that's to Koyuk out there. You go, you, then you go out in the, in the middle of nowhere. That's, so that's where Balto and Togo and the 1925 diphtheria serum run, they went to Shack Tulik and picked up the medicine and went back. So if you haven't seen that, that, that Disney movie Togo, that's where he's jumping across the ice, you know, and Leonard Seppala, played by Willem Dafoe, is doing that. And this is the finish uh, in Nome. Yeah. So there's Sonic in um, Mach 10. And then Saga, Maserati. That's uh, Mel, and that's Cadillac. I had gotten a cold. I, I, I got sick, so my voice is a little hoarse. That's the race marshal. This is his first year as a race marshal. Uh, X I did a rod musher, and, and that's Liz and Theo. It took him a minute to realize who I was. <laughs> <laughs> he like, well, he was used to seeing you on the computer screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he did say dada while I was gone, so that was pretty cute. Liz was texting me. I, got, I only got messages at two of the checkpoints because I don't get cell service until you get to a huge native village where you have cell service. And there's dad. Now, watch, watch Liz. She's going to arrange the picture because <laughs> she knows this TV stuff. That rough around Theo's, uh, Theo's uh, onesie, Martin Boozer made that rough for me in 2011, and, and it was my first rough on my Iditarod for a few years, and now I put it on his, his parka. So it's kind of big for him, but it's pretty cool. And let's see if we have any more videos, and we'll look at a couple of pictures. I think we got that. Oh, this was an it. You can just explain a little bit about what this was. Oh, you, some of you might remember this is this is kind of old school. I was so nervous. The <laughs> what year was this? Like 2015. Boys Life did an article in the newspaper, and then they wanted these short little videos for the, the Boy Scouts. And Liz hadn't trained you yet on how to do videos. No. Yeah. Totally green. Yep, so, so the bag doubles as a tent, and you can crawl in there. That sled broke on that race, so I, <laughs> I didn't do a good job. <laughs> so this is down in Juneau when I, where I used to give tours. Oh, 
man. All right, we've reached that point in the evening. We're a little bit behind, but I wanted to get through some of this really good stuff. If folks do have questions, uh, please come up to the microphone. Matt will be happy to answer. Or if not, I've got a few more I can ask him. So who wants to stump the Iditarod? Come right up to the <laughs> microphone so everybody can hear you. Well, but we're also, I didn't want to say this right away. We're recording this, and we might, we'd like to make it available since it's sold out so quick, make it available to people. So if you speak into the mic, we make sure we get good sound. No pressure. I, um, I was just curious, how do you steer, how do you direct the dogs? Because I'm an equestrian, so we have a bit in the horse's mouth. And I was just trying to figure out how you steer and go left and right. And yeah. Okay. And where, what's your name? Erica. Where are you from? Here. Mansfield. Here in Mansfield? Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. I'd just like to know. Thank you for the question, Erica. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with sled dogs, obviously that's yeah, different. You can't, you can't pull them. Um, but you do, you do use it uh, kind of by feel. So the break, you indicate the dogs. It took me while, a while to figure this out. Um, my first few years, I would just say the command to the dogs, and if they didn't get it right, I would say it louder, um, probably like a new parent or something. Um, well, you, heard, you didn't hear me? I'm just going to say it even louder. And so I didn't realize that they, the reward for them is to run. So a lot of people just assume that, I make these dogs run. But like a Labrador wants to retrieve a ball, you, you, you give what they want to them. And the sled dog wants to run. So when you're approaching a, an option in the trail, you slightly push down on the brake, which they feel, and that indicates to the dog that something's going to happen. And so I tell them the command. So it would be G to go to the right, haw to go to the left. And those are just old terms that have been around for ages. And so if they get it correct, you immediately release the brake, like confirming that behavior. And so that, that's it. And so that, that rewards them. If they get it wrong, you just simply push further down on the brake and they know they got it wrong. So your timing needs to be pretty accurate. Kind of the same idea if, if a dog sits when you tell them to sit, you'd give them a treat or pet them. You wouldn't wait five minutes and then give them the treat. See, they make that connection. Um, and so, yeah, you can just, when you get them really trained up, the good lead dogs need a trail to follow, like bumper lanes on a, on a bowling lane. They need to follow the trail. But the really amazing lead dogs, you'll say G, and they'll just bounce off the trail. And you'll say G, and they'll bounce even further. And you can say G, 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 and they'll do a whole circle. Um, and so then, once you have your main lead dog established, you constantly keep putting young dogs up there, and the, the, the main lead dog teaches the young one. And and hopefully it's just a, you know, a process that they just keep teaching each other. Sure, come on up. Oh. You mentioned a couple of repairs that you had to make along the way. What tools do you carry with you on the sled on the Iditarod? Good question, Mr. Coe. Thank you. Or I'm sorry, Mark. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have uh, I've got duct tape, rope, zip ties. Um, doesn't need to be pretty. I can just, you know, lash it all together. But in this situation, I had my Leatherman, the multi, a multi-tool, and um, I had, um, I carry two socket bits um, because the whole sled's built out of two size bolts. You know, I got, um, and then, yeah, so I used my, my socket wrench and my Leatherman to, to switch things out. Kind of like this? That was actually where it broke. Yep, that's exactly where it broke. That's before Finger Lake, yeah. And if you notice, when you look at this picture, the dogs are sleeping and resting, and you're trying to fix it. Yep. <laughs> Here's another example of not getting to rest when the dogs do. So. Yes, ma'am. Another one of our personal supporters. I have a shameless, unsolicited commercial. Uh-oh. As you can imagine, it's very expensive to run that kennel. And oh. if you are feeding and vetting 50 dogs, that's a lot. So for those that don't know, you can be a supporter, a booster, $500 a dog. It doesn't have to be one individual person. It can be a group of people, two people, four people, whatever, and see Matt or Liz, and they'll be happy to set you up with the dog. Thank you very much, Ms. Riegelman. Yeah, um, yeah, so, yeah, actually, it's, it's become a huge family process where all those people in blue are either individuals or families or groups of friends that p 
pick one dog and they'll chip $500 in for that dog and that, that helps from vet bills to of course dog food, um, straw so the dogs can sleep on, the booties on their feet. The booties are each a dollar and ten cents a piece nowadays and you'll go through about 1,500 booties just for the Iditarod alone. Um, it's, it's quite the, I mean, yeah, I don't, I've probably made a profit off of the race like two, two years out of the 13. So really, it's, it's more of a glorified hobby. Um, but um, the 17th dog booster program is the backbone of the kennel. That's, that's how we've been able to consistently kind of fund the race team. So thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, there's a thousand reasons to want to stop. What keeps you focused to keep going? Because I can't imagine that. Are you, are you talking about? For the uh, Iditarod. During the race? Yeah. Um, well, I guess, I mean, you know, I, I, I love traveling with them and, and um, going out there and trying to prove to other teams and people that, you know, we are qualified and that we can do this race and do it well. Um, but yeah, yeah the, when you're tired, things start creeping into your mind like, oh, I should take a break or I'm tired, they need more rest. And usually that's just your mind playing tricks on you, you know. Um, and so you just kind of have to bury that and know that you're trained properly and keep going. Um, it's really easy to hit the snooze button. I mean, if you hit the snooze button every morning before you go to work, think about it when you do it on one hour of sleep. I, if I hit the snooze button and it's five minutes, I, I've already practically lost the race in that like mindset. So you don't, you don't want to get into that mentality. If you put your alarm clock right up here underneath your seal skin hat and when it goes off, you get up. So there's not a main drive, it's just oh, not thinking of... I think it's, um, I mean, I think it's just the dogs, you know, it's just the, their competitive drive helps fuel my, love for sports. You know, I wanted to be a professional baseball player and I had that sad reality when I didn't make, you know, a college team and um, they filled that void because I'm kind of the player coach, you know. Um, so I guess there's that, that mutual drive and for those people that don't think that they're competitive, when one team passes another, they go bonkers. They want to go. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Uh, this race has obviously challenged you, and I'm guessing changed who you are from when you first ran it. When you have raced your last, what lasting impact in your life will you be most grateful for all your experiences? Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> Man, you know what? That Can you say that one more time? <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, well, oh, sure, sure, sure. Well, I can answer how do you turn the dogs G or Haw. But... <laughs> I, I run marathons, but I didn't start running until I was in my mid-40s. So out there in the middle on mile 18, it's like, okay, can I do this? So this yeah. race has obviously challenged you, and I'm guessing changed who you are. When you have raced your last and you're done, what lasting impact in your life will you be most grateful for on how this race has changed you? Oh, well, uh, yeah, the, the lasting impact, what I'm most grateful for is just the people in the room here, the, our supporters, my family, my wife because I couldn't continue to do this without them. Um, and then the second part of your question was what? What, what, part, what change will happen in your life? You're gonna last you for the rest of your life. What change has happened that you're gonna be most grateful for? In your own personal life, oh, as a person? Yeah, so dogs have, dogs have made me a better person. Um, anybody that owns a dog understands that they force you to make good decisions with your life. They make you get off the couch and get out of bed and go work them and go exercise them and feed them on time and get outside. And so dogs have helped me create a healthy lifestyle. Um, and then the people in our community has helped us, you know, continue to fund the, our, our, our life, our way of life. Good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Marathon running and dog mushing is a, it's a lot alike because there's a lot of times where you can just say, oh, I'm, you know, I mean, 30 mile run, 20 mile run, it's hard. Uh, following you this year, I saw that they do fat tire bike races. They do uh, people walk it, ski it. I was curious how that comes in play with 
the sled dog racers uh, are the dogs like they are with bicyclists around here and do the, do the sled dog racers are like great and other cyclists you know and also uh, what advice was either given to you that really changed and helped make you say I can do this or what advice do you have to share for the guy who says can I do this you know that's a good one too when we do see the walkers and the bicyclists out there yeah for those of you that don't know there's there's walkers they're called and they walk a thousand miles they start a week or two weeks before the Iditarod so they're there's several hundred miles out there by the time we get there it's kind of a strange thing to be in the middle of nowhere and you see somebody walking and it's like 50 below zero and there's nothing out there and yeah they have duct tape because they're frostbite you know so they put duct tape over here and they're sunburnt and the dogs see them and they start barking because they don't really understand what's going on and then when you, you get up close to them they say okay it's a, it's a human being and um, I'll high five them and say man you're crazy good luck <laughs> to which they say you're crazy have fun with all those dogs and that responsibility um, and then the bikers I mean, these are some extreme, you know, like cyclists. And yeah, the fat tire bikes are very popular up there on the snow. It spreads out the weight. Um, and so we do see them, and it's, it's usually not a big deal. I have to yell at them, though, because they have their hat on. I say, trail, you know, and then we're getting closer. I say, trail, and then they kind of, they're in, some of them are on skis, and they have to, if you sink off the side of the trail, the trail's hard packed. So if you get off the trail, you could sink up to your waist into fresh snow. So they have to be very careful to not like fall over. Um, and you go by and, and I usually tell them, I say, I passed a walker a mile ago. And if that's your competitor, I kind of tell them where they're at because they're in the dark. And um, I'll let them know if somebody's you know, looking good or looking tired. <laughs> um, and you know, Martin Boozer is my mentor. He gave me the best advice. He just said, think like a dog. At, you know, like really look at it from their perspective, you know. Um, there's a reason why they want to drink out of the toilet because it's like right there. <laughs> there's a reason why they, they, it's just you have to start thinking like a dog if you want to do better. And um, you have to give them what they need. And yeah, love and rest and good training and good food. You can't skimp on the good food. You have to buy high quality dog food. So we feed them. Beef, liver, tripe, turkey, chicken, pork belly, salmon, two types of kibble, beef fat. I can get horse, sometimes beaver. Um, and we spend hours cutting all that up with a bandsaw. We freeze it and run it through and turn it into like a shape of a Snickers bar, you know. And that way on the race you can give them a piece of meat. And you hope you've done your due diligence where you've trained them right so they can eat anything. If you have a picky eater and they say, oh, I don't want fish. So, well, you better have a, a piece of chicken. You say, we want chicken? Say, How do you want it per, per you want, you want it on a, in my hand? I'll give it to you, you know, on a plate. Um, and so if they're good eaters, they just eat everything. And that, that's a good eating team. They'll eat whatever. Yes, ma'am. Because if they don't eat, they don't have energy, they can't go. You know, it's as simple as that. How do you combat the sleep deprivation? Because I've heard of some of them falling asleep and literally falling off their sled. Yeah, <laughs> Eddie and, Burke. <laughs> and the boredom of only having yourself to talk to for such a long period of time. Say that one, the last one again. The boredom of having no one but yourself to talk to. Um, so honestly, I don't, I don't get too bored. Um, there is, yeah, there is like moments where it's, um, it's slow moving and you don't want to look at your GPS because you say, oh my gosh, I'm going five miles an hour this is going to take me an additional five hours. And in like an hour, the trail set up, the sun went down and the trail got harder and faster. And now you're moving eight miles an hour. Um, but I, not, not really the extreme boredom. I, I, some people will say, oh, traveling on the Yukon River is boring because it's just straight. But it's some pretty country and, and I might not ever do it again. So I felt really fortunate to be out there. Um, and then your other question, sleep. So my first few years, um, I wasn't managing my own sleep well because I was probably talking to my competitors and friends and, um, and I wasn't managing my hydration. I, would get, I wouldn't drink enough and my water bottles would freeze. Um, you, could, you can ask my wife Liz, she's handled on the Copper Basin 300 and she has to be, you have to have a handler go with you 
and um, clean up the straw. It's a smaller race, so they have volunteers kind of go with you. And Liz was, and every checkpoint I got to, to, mind you, it was 60 below zero the whole race. So it was very cold. And if you don't drink your water, it will freeze quickly. So at 60 below, the last thing I want to do is try to drink some water because you could frostbite your face if you pull your neck gator down. And so every, every checkpoint I got to, I would hand Liz two frozen thermoses. I'd say, can you thaw these out, please? I'm leaving in four hours. And so every checkpoint, she'd have to go thaw these thermoses out. And it would take about four hours. <laughs> <laughs> so we got really good. You turn your, you turn your water bottle upside down, and um, the top, which is now the bottom, will freeze. So when you turn it back side up, now the top is, is like, you know, not frozen, so you can, it's like, you know, flipping a lake up, upside down. Um, but you got to make sure it's screwed on real nice. You don't want it to pour all over your sled bag. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I would say managing my intake levels of uh, not eating too much dried mangoes and having a sugar crash and falling asleep. I didn't fall, I didn't, I didn't hallucinate once on this race. Uh, the first few I would hallucinate all the time. And... Um, I'm a guy that's never even had a cigarette in my life. And I, you can go on that race, and if you're tired, you will, I'll see a, a basketball hoop, and then you get up close to it, and it's just a tree. Or <laughs> I'll see, I'll see my, my childhood bed, and, um, and it's just a shadow that looks like a bed. I'm like, oh, I'm so tired, you know. And then I wear this ball cap, and I pull the rough up, and sometimes the ball cap, which makes this shape, it, it's you know, dark up here, and it looks like a mountain. You know, I don't know, it's kind of hard to describe, but you're, you get into tunnel vision, and after a while, you have to shake your head because you think you're staring at a mountain, but it's really just your, the top of your hat, you know, so, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. I have been an insider for quite a long time, and following the race, one of the first things that hit me was, oh my God, I'd be so scared to get out on that Norton Sound on the sea ice, and I know there are mushers who are perpetually afraid of that. And I know, I think it was like 2020, you had an experience with maybe some overflow. Yeah. I've always tried to figure out like, what does that look like? What does it feel like? What happens? Could you talk about that experience? Oh yeah, yeah. Thanks. So um, yeah, thanks for the question. And thanks for being an insider. Um, so that year in 2020, I, I scratched that year and they, the locals were describing it as like a 30-year storm, um, and we were in 20th place or 19th place, something like that. I was traveling with a couple other mushers, and usually the wind blows from land out to sea, and it creates this blowhole where the temperature off the ocean and the wind off the mountains creates some kind of vortex or something, and it just is really, really windy. And um, well, this year it was blowing the opposite way. It was blowing from the ocean to the land. And it was consistently blowing like 30 and 50 and 60 miles an hour to the point where it actually started to push the ocean water up onto the beach and the trail is on the beach. And the trail markers went right through like two, three feet of water. And um, the dogs and I happily went through the first one and it just got to the point where it was, it was, there was so much water, I, I just couldn't keep going. And I was helping out another musher who, um, I mean, I'm trying to paraphrase, because this is kind of a long story, but um, uh, after a while, the sled was so waterlogged, um, and I would go through the first, it was, it was bigger than this room, and so the dogs were like jumping through the water, and we'd get there, and then I would wait for another musher, and then we'd wait for the third musher, and we'd say, okay, we're 20 miles from the finish line, let's go, or 25 miles from the finish line, and then there'd be another one, and then there was another one, and another one, and um, it was to the point where we were in the water for like a couple hours, and um, it was like 30 degrees, so it wasn't, I know that sounds cold, but it wasn't that cold, um, and I mean, your boots are completely, completely soaked, your pants, your, you know, and so um, we hit our call help buttons that year. And um, they, because we were so close to the finish line, um, the Air National Guard or the whatever it was called, I can't remember if it was the Air National Guard or the Army National Guard, they sent out a Black Hawk helicopter to rescue us. So um, I thought they would just send a native on a snow machine. I thought that would be kind of cool, <laughs> like a local. But no, they, they did a training exercise. So all these guys get out and they're like top gun helmets and 
digital camo, you know, and it's like, oh my God, I'm a Chichaco again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was a rough one, um, but yeah, so that's the only thing I've ever not finished in my whole life. That one stung pretty hard. We were 20 miles from the finish line, but usually if the dogs are well trained and there's not like three feet of water, you, know, you can finish, but so we scratched. The next day, when the next group of mushers were coming through, they put in a different trail around that. And so they all went around the water. And the, the guys in front of us, the 18 or 19 mushers in front of us, they went through when the water was like that. And so I got there. And so just, just unfortunate. All right. Well, that Theo was reminding me that he's tired and he would like us to stop. <laughs> so that's going to wrap it up for us tonight. Matt, thank you very much for spending time with us tonight and sharing your great story. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to, yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. I really, really appreciate it. And I'd like to thank um, Carl for all the great work he's done. I mean, he's really kind of helped propel uh, the Iditarod sport here in this area and keep all of you guys informed. So we really appreciate your work. You didn't have to do that, and it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Well, it was just nice because some people, I, I told Matt and I never met face-to-face -face until yesterday afternoon. But it we've, felt like we've been friends yeah, for a long time. Exactly. We've talked on the phone, emails, things like that, but we never met face to face. So it was nice to finally get to do that. You have been a great audience tonight. Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for helping us raise $1,000 for the Richland County Humane Society because every dollar from every ticket sold goes to them. So we were. We took a picture tonight of Matt with the Humane Society presenting the check. We'll get that out so people can see it.